One. Wait, I, I wasn't supposed to do that. I'm not supposed to count along, am I? Oh, well. Well, good evening, everybody. Um, I'm still kind of new at this stuff, and the tech crew is very patient with me, so that's nice. Um, it's good to see every. I can't see anybody. Never mind. Yeah, I'm glad that you're here. Um, all I can see is April back there manning the camera, and she was just telling me that her birthday's in a couple of weeks, and she's going to be 47, and I can't believe one of my youth group kids is that close to 50 already. Man, I remember when I thought people who were 50 were old. So April must be old. Not me, I'm still 28. <laughs> oh, well, I'm glad you're here. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit for a little while, and I've got a couple of Bible verses I want to look at, and who knows, something interesting may come up. So the first thing I want to look at is in the Old Testament, the book of Judges, chapter 17, and we're only going to read verse 6 for right now. It says, in those days, Israel had no king, and all the people did whatever seemed right in their own eyes. And that stuck out to me because right now, most of us are living in a time where all the people around us not only are doing what seems right in their own eyes, but they're trying to require everyone else to do it too, whether it makes sense or not. And it's a somewhat frustrating time because we've got all sorts of people telling us what to do, and we've got people encouraging neighbors to spy on each other and report each other if they happen to go outside when they're not allowed to, and you can only drive certain places and you have to do certain things, and you can buy certain things, but you can't buy other things. And I don't know that any of it makes much of a difference. But boy, we've got a lot of people deciding what is right and wrong to do. And maybe I'm just a cranky old guy, but I remember when we kind of knew what was right and wrong, and people were free to make those choices on their own. Um, the part about it that seems to bug me the most is that the experts who are telling us what to do don't know anything. And I, I say that not because I think they're dumb or they're uneducated, they're very intelligent people, they're very educated people, but every bit of information they've given us for the last four weeks has turned out to be wrong. I mean, the first time I heard it, there was gonna be 2.2 million people who were gonna die in the United States. And then they adjusted their number a little bit, and they dropped it down to, oh, about 40,000. Now they're thinking maybe it's going to be half that. And everybody seems to be doing what's right in their own eyes. And there seems to be no standards anymore that are outside of us. Um, we have a lot of people who are just deciding that the rights that we've been given that are enshrined in our founding documents don't apply when there's an emergency. Which makes me wonder, who gets to decide what and when is an emergency? Because we're just doing what's right in our own eyes. We're not following rules anymore. And the truth is, there are a lot of people who kind of treat God the same way. Well, I know God says to do this, but if he only understood what situation I'm in, the rules would be different. And there's all sorts of stuff. I mean, some of it's very basic. Don't steal. Yeah, but if he knew how much I needed it, he'd understand. Well, no, the rule is still don't steal. You know, he says don't commit adultery. Yeah, but if he knew how she makes me feel, he'd understand. No, the rules are still the rules. The one that always bugged me when I was much, 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 much younger was obey your parents and the Lord. And I would tell God, if you knew who these people were that you made my parents, you'd understand why I have to disobey. I did that a lot. Um, that never seemed to 
change anything that I learned in church or anything the Bible had to say because God likes us to do what's right in his eyes, not our eyes. And God likes us to do what he tells us to do, not what we think needs to be done. And the interesting thing is, we've been given a tremendous amount of freedom as children of God. We used to have to live according to a very strict set of guidelines and rules. There were 613 of them in the Old Testament that we had to follow exactly all the time if we were going to stay in right standing with him. And of course, the thing is, nobody can do that. Nobody. And the agreement that he had with us was that if we did that, we were good in his eyes. But since we couldn't do that, he came up with a sacrifice system that helped us stay in relationship with him. But there were very specific rules that you had to follow. And a lot of them don't make any sense to us. But I noticed that God never said, ah, because that doesn't make any sense, I'll drop that one. He didn't do that. It got to the point where the Messiah that he'd been promising us for thousands of years came. His name was Jesus. And Jesus lived a perfect life. He did everything exactly right, and he paid the price for all of our mistakes, bad choices, and outright rebellion. And so the agreement changed. That's why the Bible's set up into two sections, the Old Testament and the New Testament. And we've been given a lot of freedom. If we accept the work Jesus did for us, we're right in God's eyes, even though we may have messed something up today. I'm sure I messed something up today. I know I messed something up yesterday. But I'm still right in God's eyes because of what Jesus did. The Apostle Paul tells the church in Corinth in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, he says, you say, I'm allowed to do anything. It's interesting to me that Paul doesn't correct them. He says, but not everything is good for you. Isn't that weird? That in the Bible, we're talking about people who are followers of Jesus, who think they're allowed to do anything, and Paul doesn't say, you're wrong, you have to follow the rules. He says, you say you can do anything, but not everything's good for you. Now, what I've noticed is that if I do something that isn't what God wants me to do, God never says, that's it, that's too far, I don't love you anymore. There's nothing I can do to make God not love me. But when I do stuff that I probably shouldn't be doing, there are still consequences. A lot of us really, really, really wish that there were no consequences. If I drive my car too fast, not that I've ever done that, That doesn't mean God doesn't love me anymore. But it also doesn't mean that the police officer who pulls me over doesn't get to write me a ticket. He still does because there are consequences. I really like ice cream, but I don't get to eat it very often because it's not that good for me. If all I did was eat ice cream, I would not be a healthy person. There are consequences. Paul says, you say you can do anything, but not everything is good for you. Paul says, you say I'm allowed to do anything, but not everything is beneficial. Don't be concerned for your own good, but be concerned for the good of others. So I may be able to do anything, and it doesn't affect God's love for me, but it does affect the people around me. It affects my wife and my kids. It affects my neighbors. It affects the people I work with. And I need to keep in mind what's good for them. So I have a tremendous amount of freedom, but that freedom always comes with a responsibility. Now here's where we're gonna spend most of the, 
the time tonight. It's in one of my favorite books in the Bible, the book of Galatians. And once again, it's the Apostle Paul writing to the church in Galatia and talking to them about where they're starting to miss what's really important. And in Galatians chapter 5, starting in verse 13, it says, For you've been called to live in freedom. We all like freedom. We especially like freedom when we find it being taken away from us. In fact, we probably didn't realize how free we were until we started losing some of that freedom for reasons that don't make sense to us. I, I've teased my kids who are now in their early to mid-20s, and I would say, you know, back before you were born when your mother and I used to do fun things. Because the truth is, life changed when we had kids. Rhonda had a friend who started complaining when Wendy was born. And she said, you're just no fun anymore. Everything has to be about the baby. And Rhonda looked at her and said, um, yeah, I'm a mother now. I've got someone depending on me. We didn't realize how free we were until we had kids and we lost some of that freedom. Now our kids are growing up and they're going to be moving out and we may get some of that freedom back. Of course, we're too old to enjoy some of it now, but that's the way life is. Paul says, you've been called to live in freedom, my brothers and sisters, but don't use your freedom to satisfy your sinful nature. Instead, use your freedom to serve one another in love. We've been called to live in freedom, but the freedom is to serve each other, to help each other, because that's what we do when we're part of the body of Christ. In verse 14, Paul says, the whole law can be summed up in this one command, love your neighbor as yourself. But if you're always biting and devouring each other, watch out. Beware of destroying one another. Now, I've noticed that people's patience is starting to wear a little thin. And not everybody's being nice anymore. I was at the Kaiser Health Center here in Riverside today picking up a prescription for Rhonda. You have to walk through a long line under the direct supervision of security personnel and you have to stay six feet, apart, six feet apart and they've got the tape on the ground to make sure you know what is six feet apart. And then you wait in line to get up to the nurse or the person, the, whoever the employee is that stands there at the door. You can't just go into the pharmacy and you've got to show your ID. You've got to show your medical card. You've got to demonstrate that you're there for a good reason. And then they say, we'll text you when it's okay for you to come in. If you don't hear from us in 20 minutes, come back and check. And I'm thinking, great. That means I get to walk all the way back out to the parking lot and get in my car and sit there and wait because it was kind of warm this afternoon. And I wasn't in a particularly pleasant or forgiving mood about this. And I got all the way in the car, turned the radio on, got about halfway through the song and my phone buzzed and they were telling me I could come in. So I got out of my car, locked the car again, walked all the way through the whole process again. Then I was allowed to go in the pharmacy, except the security people stopped me twice in about 20 feet to take my temperature. Because they wanted to make sure that I wasn't sick, you know, because the one place you can't be sick is at a hospital. And so I went in and I, my temperature was fine and I went in and stood in line six feet apart from other people and waited for a little bit and went up and got the prescription and made the drastic error of attempting to hand my medical card to the person behind the glass. And she reached out to get it and went, oh wait, I'm not allowed to touch that. 
Just hold it up to the glass so I can see it. And I'm not enjoying this anymore. I never really was. But that doesn't give me an excuse to be mean to people. That doesn't give me an excuse to have a short temper. That doesn't give me an excuse to devour other people because I can't use freedom to do that. Paul goes on in verse 16. So I say, let the Holy Spirit guide your lives. Then you won't be doing what your sinful nature craves. You know, the Holy Spirit has never told me to lose my temper. I don't know that the Holy Spirit has ever told me to cuss. It's never told me to be snotty with somebody. So I'm supposed to use my freedom to do what the Holy Spirit tells me to do. The sinful nature wants you to do evil, which is just the opposite of what the Spirit wants. And the Spirit gives us desires that are the opposite of what the sinful nature desires. These two forces are constantly fighting each other. Where are they fighting each other? In me. There's a battle going on constantly in me over who am I going to follow? Am I going to follow the Holy Spirit? Or am I going to follow what I want? Now, I want you to notice here that Paul doesn't say, depending on the circumstances. Paul doesn't say, follow the Holy Spirit unless you're really annoyed. Paul doesn't say, follow the Holy Spirit unless someone does something that's unfair. There are no exceptions here. Paul says, follow the Holy Spirit. These two forces are constantly fighting each other, so you are not free to carry out your good intentions. It's this battle that can stop you from doing the stuff that you know you want to do. Because, and it's frustrating, but I choose to do what I'm not supposed to. A lot. You see, the choice is up to me. Well, if all we can do is follow God, how can that be free? You get to make the choice. See, if there's one thing about God that I've learned to appreciate is he treats us like adults. He doesn't make us do things. We get to make the choice. You know, little kids don't get to make too many choices. I didn't get to choose what I had for dinner. I ate what was made for dinner. Most of the time, I didn't get to choose what I watched on TV. I watched what dad wanted to watch on TV. I didn't get to choose whether or not the lawn needed to be mowed. I mowed the lawn when I was told to, most of the time. Adults get to make their own choices because adults are the ones who deal with the consequences. God treats us like adults. We get to choose. This is what the Holy Spirit wants. This is what the old sin nature wants. What are you going to do? Now, I find it interesting that God treats us like adults when the culture we we live in treats us like children. There's all sorts of people trying to control every aspect of our life. And God doesn't do that. God gives us freedom. In verse 18, Paul says, When you are directed by the Spirit, you are no longer under obligation to the law of Moses. Because when you're following the Spirit, you're always doing what God wants you to do. It's pretty simple. Verse 19. Paul says, when you follow the desires of your sinful nature, the results are very clear. Sexual immorality, impurity, 
lustful pleasures. Now, remember in the Bible, when it talks about lust, that's not meaning strong sexual desires. It, that applies, but that's not simply what that means. When it talks about the lusts of the flesh, it means desires that are contrary to the Spirit of God. So Paul says lustful pleasures, things that we enjoy that the Spirit of God has not told us to do. Idolatry, sorcery. Idolatry and sorcery. That's some pretty serious stuff. Well, no, it's really simpler than that. When we are attempting to control outcomes in a way that we want them to, that's where sorcery and idolatry and the occult comes in. Why do you deal with idols? To get what you want. Why do you deal with sorcery? To get what you want. Why do you deal with the occult? To get what you want. See, we don't get to tell God what we want. We're supposed to be paying attention to what he wants. He goes on. Hostility, quarreling, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambition, dissension, division, envy, drunkenness, wild parties, and other sins like these. Let me tell you again, as I have before, anyone living that sort of life will not inherit the kingdom of God. That doesn't mean people living that way of life are not loved by God. God loves all of us. And he's given us the freedom to make some remarkably bad decisions. You'll hear people say, well, why would God let something like that happen? Most of the time, it's because somebody made a remarkably bad decision. Or groups of people made remarkably bad decisions. Or people made remarkably bad decisions in response to some remarkably bad decisions. God didn't do any of that. People did. Because God gave us freedom. But the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love. Joy. Peace. Patience. Kindness. Goodness. Faithfulness. Gentleness and self-control. There is no law against these things. Love. Well, that's wanting what's best for somebody else. I love my wife. Therefore, I want what's best for her. I love my kids. Therefore, I want what's best for them. I love my family. I love my church family. I love my community. That doesn't mean I want things from them. I want what's best for them. Joy. Now, joy and happiness are different. Happiness is kind of fleeting. It depends on your circumstances. Joy is something that we can experience in all circumstances. Joy is what Jesus came to bring into the world. Next Christmas, pay attention and see how many songs you hear have the word joy in them. Peace. I have not been able to figure out how to live in peace and watch the news. Because the entire point of the news, with the exception of most of the weather is to keep me agitated. So I watch a lot of weather and then I see what's going on and I can tell by the tone of the voice of the person reading the news. They don't want me to be at peace. 
They want me to be agitated. I'm tired of being agitated. Patience. Patience means you don't mind waiting. And that's a tough one. Because none of us like to wait. But you can get to the place where it doesn't make that big of a deal. Kindness. You mean God simply wants us to be nice to other people? Yes. Yes. Goodness. He wants us to do the right thing. He wants us to be good people. Faithfulness. He wants us to do what we say we're going to do. Every one of us has friends that will tell us they'll do something, but you know there's probably an 80% chance that it isn't going to happen. That's not faithfulness. Jesus said, when you say yes, mean yes. When you say no, mean no. And if you say you're going to do something, do it. Faithfulness means keeping your commitments, keeping your priorities straight. Gentleness. We all like to be treated gently. None of us like to be yelled at. None of us like to be bullied. And other people like it when we treat them gently. That doesn't mean we always give people what they want. It doesn't mean that we always allow stuff that maybe shouldn't be happening. But we can do it gently. Self-control. I just couldn't help it. That's not self-control. And you can always help it. In my time as principal of our schools here, Every once in a while, it didn't happen very often, but every once in a while, a couple of students would get into a bit of a tussle. And one student had made another student agitated and angry. And so the student that got made angry usually did something, took a shot at, took a poke at, you know, did something, and they got into a little bit of a, a conflict. And inevitably, the student who threw the first punch would say, I just couldn't help it. And I can remember asking one kid, I say, have I ever made you irritated? And he says, oh yeah. I said, how come you didn't throw a punch at me? Are you kidding? You're the principal. Oh, in other words, you made that choice. We all have self-control. We have the freedom to choose what we're going to do. And all of these characteristics are the fruit that the Spirit of God produces when we're following Him in our lives. We don't have to work at this stuff. This is what happens when the Spirit of God is leading our lives. Now that's something that's a little hard to get your head around sometimes because you can't try and do any of this stuff. I have never been able to to work at being patient. The more I try to be patient, the less patient I am with how long it's taking me to be patient. I get very frustrated. But if I focus on the Holy Spirit and following Him, I find out, son of a gun. I was kind of patient there. Interesting. See, this is the fruit of that comes from the Holy Spirit living in us and us following him. In verse 24, Paul goes on, he says, those who belong to Christ Jesus have nailed the passions and desires of their sinful natures to his cross and crucified them there. What the heck does that mean? Well, what happened to Jesus on the cross? He died. 
if we nailed the passions and desires of our sinful natures to the cross and crucified them there, what happened to them? They died. They can't hurt us anymore. If we've done that, they are not the ones controlling our lives anymore because we've decided to follow the Spirit, not what we think we might want to do at any given moment in time. Since we are living by the Spirit, let us follow the Spirit's leading in every part of our lives. You know, it's easy for most of us to follow the Spirit at church. It's easy for most of us to follow the Spirit if we run into the pastor at the grocery store. It's easy for someone to follow the Spirit when they think they're being watched. But Paul says we need to follow the Spirit in every aspect of our lives. We need to follow the Spirit when we're dealing with our annoying neighbor We need to follow the Spirit when we're dealing with our annoying relatives at Thanksgiving. We need to follow the Spirit when we're watching the news. And I'm pretty sure a lot of times the Spirit just wants us to turn the channel. We need to follow the Spirit when we get bad news. In every aspect of our lives, we need to follow the Spirit when we get good news. Paul says, follow the Spirit in every aspect of our lives. And then he says, let us not become conceited. Conceited is simply thinking you're better than you are. Well, how can you get conceited if you're following the Spirit? Right. Exactly. I'm not behaving this way because I'm special. I'm behaving this way because that's what God's doing through me. It isn't me. On Sunday, we talked about how everything we do should reflect Jesus, not us. You can't get conceited and follow the Spirit. Paul says, don't provoke one another or be jealous of one another. That's what following the Spirit does. We don't get to make decisions based on what we think is right. We get to make decisions based on what God says is right. We don't get to choose to go do what we've always wanted to do. We're supposed to choose to follow the Spirit and go where He tells us to go, do what He tells us to do. Help the people He shows us to help. Love the people that we come in contact with. And when we do that, the fruit of the Spirit, Paul just told us about. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. When we're following the Spirit, that's what our lives are going to look like. Not because we're better, because the Holy Spirit is good. Not because we're special, but because the Holy Spirit is in us. Not because we're more important than those people that aren't behaving the way we think they should, but because the Holy Spirit is in us, and the Holy Spirit is God who loves people. So in these somewhat weird and challenging times when lots of folks are trying to decide what we should and shouldn't do. 
we can't fall into that game. We need to pay attention to what the Holy Spirit is having us do and how he's having us interact with people. And we get to watch and see what he does when the rest of the world looks like it's going crazy. All right? It's not really complicated. It's just following God. Now, if you're giving to keep the work that God is doing through Bethel, we certainly appreciate it. You can use the app. You can give on the church webpage, BethelChristianCenter.com. You can come by the office. There are people here during office hours during the week. We appreciate greatly the generosity of our church family. Rhonda always seems to give you a rundown of what's happening around campus. And she has that information. I don't, but I do know that there's drywall in the men's restroom again, and we're getting ready to start wrapping that thing up. It's going to take us a few weeks, but we're going to do it. And the men's restroom is going to be functional. That'll be great. And all you ladies will just have to take our word for it. Because you don't want to go in there and see that. (laughs) Uh, Other than that, I, I... Thank God that he is with all of us every day and that he's helping us navigate these weird times and that he's doing so many good things. I hope we're paying attention to it. So let's wrap this up with a quick prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for tonight. Thank you for my church family and their willingness, even when we can't get together, to join together on Facebook, to join together on YouTube, and be together in spirit, even as we're sitting in our houses or in our cars, watching on our phones or TVs or computers. I I am so grateful for my church family, and I'm so looking forward to being able to get together again in person. And I know that time is coming, and I'm asking that it comes sooner than later, but I'm being patient. Not because I want to be, but because that's what happens when the Holy Spirit works through us. So thank you for everything you're doing. Thank you for being such a good and loving father. And we pray all of this in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. Have a great evening, everybody. See you Sunday morning.